So we are uh, on the guilt of man section or part four and uh, I, going back through the videos or the audios and listening um, and through my notes and looking at things I've I've kind of decided that there are some things I didn't cover that I really need to cover now I know these are not in sync these probably should have been covered in the first two or three lessons but uh, my lesson plan is you know somewhat uh, being altered as I move through this because I, there were a lot of things that I just I'm trying to do this within a year and it's just not probably going to happen but we're going to try but we're going to be on the fast track and as long as Jason is two and a half years in the book of Acts in the 15th chapter then I'm okay all right so I figure if I can get through Romans in a year then I'll be able to get through Galatians in a year and I'll be able to get through Ephesians in maybe a year and a half and so forth so we we'll go through these things try to get through them quick uh, I really would like to teach all of Paul's epistles this way, at least, if not verse by verse, I'd like to teach them all uh, for you and to you uh, as a 57-year-old as opposed to a 30-year-old, okay? So some of the things that I said back when I was 30 and 35 and 40, and, you know, they weren't probably as correct as they could have been because you learn, you grow. And uh, so it's important. I learned a lot this week at the conference. I personally learned a lot. And that's because I was listening to men that are far beyond my capabilities. And I really appreciate having that many men like that around me. I, I, it's really great. And uh, so some of those men uh, just have, we've been studying together for 30 years. And uh, they're, just, they're just unbelievable students. So it's great to listen to these things and learn something. It just keeps you, it keeps you aware of the fact that you can always keep learning. There is no point where you arrive when it comes to the Bible. Okay, that's never going to happen. So just don't, you know, don't. That's why we say we don't have scholars. We don't, we don't believe in that sort of thing. We're just Bible students and we just keep on learning. Uh, Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 have been basically the subject matter and will be the subject matter until we get through the end of chapter 3. Now, that's a lot of work yet. That's going to be a ways. But Romans 1, 2, and 3... Uh, some of the things that we talked about, uh, I kind of missed a few things, and I want to talk to you about it. Uh, Romans chapter uh, 1, 2, 3. These issues of the, the Gentile ignorance, the issue of the, um, the, the whole thing of, of what's going on with, the, we talked about the guilt issue with them. We talked about the sin issue, okay? Uh, actually, it was sins, excuse me. So, the guilt of the Gentiles, the sins of the Gentiles, and the same thing, the guilt of the Jews, and the sins of the Jews. And that's what's happening in chapter 1 and chapter 2. God is basically teaching us, and Paul is systematically going through here, as he begins with the gospel of Christ, and he goes through and he begins to do this in such a way that he's like an attorney producing... Uh, uh, like it's got an arraignment and some indictments and there's going to be a conclusion and there's going to be a verdict and there's going to be this whole thing is very legal and very clean and very well done it's very smoothly done this is not this is not just Paul ranting on about something this is God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit all working in conjunction to bring about a new plan and a new program that is getting ready to take place in the dispensation of the grace of God. And, and Romans is what kicks this off. This is a primary book. It is the primary book for Christianity. So we went through here and we started talking about these things. And if you notice, I give you some sections and I give you verses. Like if I, if I give you these verses, like I'm talking about the beginning of nations and the fall of nations, which we really didn't touch on too much. That's what I want to talk about a little bit today. Genesis 1 to 10, Genesis 11, 1 to 9. We said the same thing about these sections in Romans 1, 2, and 3. So the section that we're on right now, that we're studying right now in lesson number, part number 4 on this, is Romans 2.17. If you go to Romans 2.17, and it's going to go on, and it's going to finish, this section that we've been on is going to be finished at Romans 3.20. Now, Romans 2.17 to 3.20 is not a section of its own. It's just where we are right now because I've already gone through these other parts of it. The, the beginning of this second section is Romans chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to 3.20. So Romans 2, 1 to 3.20 is, is the section we're working on. Romans chapter 1, 18, where it begins with the wrath of God, you've, you've 
you've gotten through the first 17 verses of the book, which is the introduction, and then in verse 18 to 32 is that part about the Gentiles being given up, the part about their sins, the part about their guilt. I mean, he just hammers the Gentiles in, in those, 30, those uh, from 18 to 32, those verses. Then in chapter 2, he begins to focus on the Jews. Now, the, the Gentiles are still in play. They're, it's like he does this to the Gentiles in chapters 118 to 32, and then he drags them into chapter 2, and he starts talking about the Jews. So he kind of gathers them together. It's like you carry two buckets together, okay? And now he's got them together, and that's where he starts in verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. When you start seeing a phrase like, O man, it sounds like how we talked in the 60s. You got to go to college. Oh man, I don't want to do that. You know, you got to go to high school. I don't. Oh man, I don't want to do that. Well, oh man is an excuse for some people. That's the way they cry about things. But today in the Bible, as we read this, this is not talking about that. This is talking about therefore thou art excusable, oh man, meaning mankind. He says, oh man, whosoever thou art. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a Gentile or whether you're a, a, a Jew, you are guilty. He says, when you judge other people, you condemn yourself. When you judge other people and you turn around and do the same thing, you're judging what? Yourself. You're condemning yourself. This is what he says in verse 1. Notice what he says uh, because of that in verse 2. He says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So if you commit this, if you go out and you judge other people for what they're doing, we seen any of that today? Are people really upset about the way we judge each other today? Right, they are. They're really upset about everything. They're upset about racial issues. They're upset about gender issues. They're upset about immigration issues. They're upset about criminality. This lady that just got shot out in San Francisco by this illegal immigrant, uh, really upset about that. They're upset about the president. They're upset about the Congress. They're upset about the money situation. They're upset about everything. There is more discontent right now in this country than there has been since the 60s and 70s. And I can tell you, I lived through the late 60s. And when I came through to Florida in 68, there were, I told you this before, there were several cities burning, okay, in this country, and they were on fire. And uh, there were things going on that were so radical that you cannot believe what they were doing. They were protesting against the Vietnam War so hard that it caused Lyndon Johnson to resign the presidency. He couldn't take it, okay? They res they, they, there were so many things going on. This country underwent a coup d'etat in 1963 in November, and when President John F. Kennedy left Tampa, he, he had been going to various cities, and they're going to hit him in every city. They just wanted to wait till the right one. And in Dallas, they got him, and they took the country. They took the country. That was a coup d'etat. When you take out the President of the United States, that means somebody has got a conspiracy, and that conspiracy, they did their thing. And, uh, and so later on, they hit his brother. Later on, they hit Martin Luther King. Later on, I mean, 68 was one of the most volatile years that has ever been in this country's history. And uh, I just thought it was the year we moved to Florida. Uh, we moved here in August of 68. But by August of 68, there were cities burning all across the country. The Tet Offensive had taken place in January, the beginning of the year. They almost, almost overran South Vietnam with the North, North Vietnamese, with the Viet Cong. And so it started out that way it, with the Tet Offensive. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And by Christmas, it was just, it was unbelievable. And I was totally oblivious to this at 10 years old. I, I, all I saw was Walter Cronkite, the body count every night, all of that stuff was going on. And in our neighborhood, the kids that played, we didn't play Cowboys and Indians. Uh, up north, we used to play Cowboys and Indians when I was growing up. We played on, on horses. And we would run around on horses and play Cowboys and Indians. So we, we'd play uh, out in the woods like Cowboys and Indians, that kind of stuff. Down here, the game changed. So when I moved here, uh, a kid down the street handed me an M16, only it was a plastic squirt gun version, okay? And now the battle is between the American soldier and the Viet Cong. And there were teams in the neighborhood. And we 
actually did that stuff. We played in real time. We played out what was playing out on the TV. And uh, my brothers, when they were growing up, I have pictures of them uh, standing in front of the, my dad took pictures of them standing in front of the Christmas tree, and they're both decked out in army gear. It was all World War II stuff, you know. It looked just like a World War II soldier. And the, the, all that old army gear that they used to have, they had full-blown uniforms, helmets, everything, the whole gig, I mean, both of them. And as they grew out of all that stuff, I inherited it, and so I had all that stuff. And you look at what's going on around us, and everybody is upset about everything. And all of these things that are going on is because there are cycles of operation happening in the nations. And the nations, right here, is who, who Paul is dealing with in chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, he's dealing with God's nation, his nation. So what we're, what we're doing is we're coming to a conclusion that as the nations form back here, we're going to look at that in a minute, as they form, they were left down here to run all the way through and God elevated through Abraham his own nation with a promise, and that's what this blue fence is all about, this wall. And this wall here separates those nations from God's nation. And if you're going to get through that wall, you're going to go through one of these three doors. You can go through one of those three doors. You can help a Jew believe a Jew or become a Jew, and you could be a part of God's nation. Now, in the, in the situation in the Bible, God's nation is never reckoned among the nations. She's always separate. Okay? So God has a nation and it's separate. The nations have a, a, a progressive nature to how they came about. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. So as you begin in Romans chapter 1 with the gospel of Christ, you've got a whole section here. And that section really starts in Romans 1.15 if you'll notice that, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, and I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So you see the term there. That runs all the way to chapter 5, verse 20. Okay, so that's one section. So these sections are actually kind of overlapping and, and so forth. So you have to kind of be careful depending on what subject you're talking about. The power of God in the gospel is only two verses. Look over here at Romans 1 and look at 15. It's three verses, excuse me. Verse 15, which I just mentioned, then 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Now we're going to find out about the revelation of the righteous judgment of God and the righteous way that God's going to take care of the problem of sin. It's revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So in this dispensation of grace, what do we do? How do we get saved? We believe in what? I asked one of the girls a while ago, what do we have to believe in? She said, sin. I said, well, that's a good start. You believe that you're a sinner, you get saved. And then the other one said, well, you've got to believe in the cross. I said, well, yeah, you do have to believe something about the cross. When we say we preach the cross, do we actually teach that you put your faith in the cross? Well, we might say it. But do we really have any way to be saved just by putting our faith in the cross itself? Do you think in Catholicism, for instance, or in Christendom in, in general, do you think the cross has become somewhat iconic? You see a cross, and you see it on every steeple, you see it on the sides of airplanes, you see, I mean, you see it on flags, you see it on, it's, it's iconic. So just believing there was a cross that somebody hung on, is that going to save you? The Jews will believe that Jesus, you talk to Jews today and they'll say, yeah, we believe that, that Jesus was a live person, a live person, a real person, that he died on a cross. We believe that. Historically, we believe it. Is that going to save you? No. See, we don't preach the cross that way. We preach, what we preach in the cross is the faith of Jesus Christ, that he had faith to go do on that cross what needed to be done. If he hadn't have been faithful unto death and obedient unto death, what would have happened? We wouldn't have anything to believe in. So the faith of Jesus Christ begins with the message of Paul in Romans 1, 2, and 3. Israel did not understand this when it happened. So it happened there historically, but it's not explained until we get over here. 
So as you go through this, you see that this thing kind of unfolds this way. The power of God is in the gospel. The wrath of God, we just said it, Romans 1, 18 to 32. The guilt of the Jews, the guilt of the Gentiles. There's whole sections on that. We just, we just covered them. And first he deals with the Gentiles. Then he deals with the Jews. Then you deal with Gentile ignorance. You know, I, one of the things that kind of, kind of uh, sparked me to, to, to revisit some of these things is uh, kids will ask the funniest questions and they'll say, what's a Gentile? By the time you get done preaching for several weeks on Gentiles, you, and somebody asks you what a Gentile is, what should you do? You should maybe teach what that is in the Bible <laughs> because they don't always know what a Gentile is. I asked my dad the same question, and he says, anybody who's not a Jew. That was his way of explaining it. So when you hear the word Gentile, and you say, well, everybody knows what that is, well, that's because you've been studying it, but, but really, it's not always understood by people. The Gentiles... It's kind of a strange way to look at it, but the, the Gentile, that's all there ever was until the nation of Israel was formed. There were no Jews or Hebrews before Abraham. So 2,500 years from Adam to Moses, and then you've got to go back because they were in Egypt for 400 years. So now you've got about 2,100 years or so, approximately, from Adam to the time Abraham gets called in Genesis chapter well, I think probably it's more like 23 or 2400 years technically. But what's so strange is when men teach Genesis, they will teach the first 12 chapters and, and, and then maybe just skip the rest because out of the 50 some odd chapters of Genesis, 2500 years or so happen in the first 12 chapters. Isn't that weird? So you say, wow, that's where all the important stuff is. That's right. And once you get to the Abrahamic covenant and he, and he makes that fork in the road happen, then everything else is just the history of Abraham and his family. And the end of Genesis, it ends with Joseph going down and they bury him in a coffin in Egypt. And that's how it ends. So from, from Genesis chapter, say, 22, uh, all the way well, when the time... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then by the time Jacob is in his uh, 80 or 80s or so, I think he was 80 some odd years old, they go down into Egypt. Uh, I made a note this morning when I was studying that when you, when you look at uh, somebody, we were having this discussion about Job, and, and so if you, if you go to, to look at Job's genealogy, you find out that he's one of four sons from what son? I didn't know. Uh, years ago, I kept trying to figure this out, and I couldn't find it. And finally, it dawned on me. It was right there in front of me. And we were having this discussion about this at camp one year. And I wasn't really sure about Job's origin. So I began to study it out. And, and you find out that Job is one of four sons of Issachar. So Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons, and one of those sons is Issachar, and Issachar had four sons, and one of those four sons is Job. And so you see that during the time they're in Egypt, right in that beginning of that, a matter of fact, it was before Egypt because Job went down with his grandpa Jacob into Egypt when they all went down there. If you remember, they all, the, whole, the whole clan moved to Egypt because Joseph was there. And once they realized Joseph was alive, they all went there and they were all trying to save their lives because there was no food anywhere in the world except for Egypt. And so they all go down there and, and I think the, the amount of people that were in Jacob's family was around 82. It was like 70 or 80 souls that went down into Egypt with him. Those are all his sons and all their families and so forth. So he's got grandsons going down into Egypt with him and Job was who knows how high. That there's you place him in the history and you see, okay, so Somewhere along the line, when we start reading the book of Job, we've got to figure out, where is this guy? Well, he's outside of Egypt. We know that. So he's grown older. He's got kids that are grown, and they've got wives. And so now we kind of get some idea. So Job and Abraham, they're pretty close, right? And Job's right here in this area right here. And, and so as you begin to look at it and start placing these things, you realize that, okay, the question comes up now. Where do the nations begin? Turn to Genesis chapter 1.
and turn to Acts chapter 17. So we'll just do a brief thing on this real quick and then we'll... Paul's going to mention it in Acts 17. Uh, it's laid out for you in Genesis 1 through 10. I wrote that up there. See the beginning of nations? Genesis 1 through 10. This is the beginning, and this is the fruit of the four institutions that God sets up in... You can go ahead and go to chapter 10 if you want, because that's where we're going to end up. We're going to be there in 11 here right soon. So, so you see that there's a big divider here. What would be the divider? From the time that civilization began, turn to Genesis 4, and then turn to Genesis 10, and then we'll be there at Genesis 11. They're on the same, right next to each other. So you go to Genesis 4, and you see Cain in the issue of the first murder. And then if you go to 16, verse 16... And notice what it says, Genesis 4, 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad and so forth. And just keeps going. Now, this is an advanced civilization. This is not a bunch of monkeys, okay? This is not a bunch of, of primordial uh, you know, uh, troglodytes. This, this is not that way. These people are skilled people. They're learning everything they have to learn from God himself, passed down from Adam and all the way through, and this is very early on. If you'll notice that the first thing they learn how to do is disobey God. What happens in verse 17? And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch, and he builded a city. What was he supposed to do? Well, go down, go down in verse... Uh, uh, verse 12, he says, When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. A fugitive and a vagabond. What are they doing? When a person is on the lamb, what are they doing? They're running. They're, they're, they're trying to get away. They're trying to, to, to get... They're not going to be able to put down roots like farmers do. And so his only alternative... He's not going to farm because he's already been told it's not going to yield any strength. You're not going to grow anything anymore. Okay, That was one of the punishments for bringing it to the altar in the first place. You don't bring fruits and vegetables from a cursed earth and put it on the altar and offer it to God. How many of you ever re-gift? You ever get a gift from somebody and turn around and hold on to it and then turn around and try to give it to somebody else? You ever seen people do that? Well, that's pretty lowly thought of, isn't it? I think it's funny myself because people give people hard time for regifting, and it's like, well, what's this sitting there? Give it to somebody else. I give mine to Salvation Army. That's where I give all my gifts. <laughs> if you give me a gift and I can't use it, I'm going to give it to Salvation Army because I can't store it. You know, that's the beauty of having a small home. You got an excuse to get rid of everything, and it works. Okay, I can tell you that I couldn't have a big enough house to hold everything uh, my kids and family want to hold on to. Okay, if you don't make those trips, you know what's going to happen? It's just going to be there, okay? And you're going to start re-gifting. person says, I gave that to you last Christmas. <laughs> you say, yep, and I'm giving it right back. Have you ever seen people that have gifts that they pass around the family like that and make a joke? You know? Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, the, the, the funny-looking lamp or the funny statue or the goofy thing, and each year they wrap it up and give it to somebody else as a joke. Well, it is kind of funny, and it's not, it's not a bad thing. It's just that... When you bring the wrong gift to God, what is he going to do? Well, in God's case, he gave him opportunity to what? To do the right thing, and he wouldn't do it. So he, he, he curses him. And so he goes down, and he builds a city. And this is a very advanced civilization. Go over and uh, look, at, uh, look at verse uh, 21. Of course, they have cattle in verse 20, but look at verse 21. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of, and of every artificer of brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. So they're working in brass and iron in the fourth chapter of Genesis. Now, brass is made of what? 
That's a composite metal. What's it made out of? Anybody know? How do you make brass? Brass, you don't dig brass up. You make brass. So you start with what? Copper and tin, right? You, you put them together in a certain mixture with a few other items, and what happens? You get a really strong metal. Brass is strong. I mean, it's super strong. And if you try to do something with just plain copper, it's soft. You can, you can beat it like gold, okay? If you have tin, it's also fairly weak. It's brittle. It'll get brittle. But it's still strong. But when you make brass, wow, that stuff is great. And, and later on, you see the even more advanced. So these guys that try to tell you there was none of this stuff going on, you know, before such and such age, hey, here it is, okay? And this is only a 6,000-year program from where you are right now all the way back here. I'm not saying the earth is 6,000 years old. I'm saying that civilization is 6,000 years old, okay? And he says, and Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. And he goes on. He goes on. He's going to brag. Notice what he says. He says, Hearken unto my speech, verse 23, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. So he, he slew a kid, a guy. But why did he do it? He says, it was to my wounding. It was to my hurt. What was he doing? He was defending himself. He's in a, he's in a scuffle and he kills the guy. So he has a much better defense than Cain does. Cain murdered his brother. He, he came up and hit him with a rock or whatever and killed him. He hated him. He killed him, okay? But this man, he does it out of self-defense, and he's boasting because he's saying in verse 24, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, which God put the mark on him, okay? If you go down and look at verse 15, they set the mark upon Cain lest any finding him should kill him. The idea was that they would be punished if they killed Cain. I believe God was giving Cain a chance to make up his mind, and he did for a long time. But here the idea, he never did believe, we, we don't learn that till the other end of the Bible, but you do see here in verse 24, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. So, so I'm really going to be protected, okay? I mean, I am really going to be, uh, I've really got a case and so forth. So th that's how it starts. That's the beginning. And so as you see up here, go to Genesis chapter 10. As you see up here on the board, I have put uh, volition, marriage, family, and nations. You see that? The four institutions. You've all heard this before from me. Under family, I put tribes because that's what tribes are. They're just large extended families. In the Indian uh, population here in the United States, you would hear it called the Choctaw Nation or the, the uh, Sioux Nation because they've gone way beyond individual families. They're just a huge giant gene pool of Indians that all live in one place and do this and they call themselves tribes but when they get multiple tribes of the same families they're called a nation okay so you see how that's on a kind of on a small scale well that scale goes from being small and regional to being very large and then it completely is completely wiped out at the flood okay turn over to Genesis chapter 10 And after they're destroyed in the flood, after not listening to Noah, there emerges a new group of people, and these were all the descendants of Noah and his three sons. So now we're going to start the whole thing over again, and now we're going to begin a new process of building the nations. And they were subverted by a heretic. Look at chapter 10, verse 9. And if you look at verse 6, you see these are the sons of Ham, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And you see their, their sons, their, the, the offspring, okay? So you see, you see the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizram, uh, Put, and Canaan. And then down in verse 9, you see that there's, or verse 8, you see, and Cush begat Nimrod. You see that? He began to be a mighty one in the earth. So he's rising in stature. Verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He hunts men, by the way. And he's a picture here. We'll find this out later on. He's a picture here of the Antichrist. Okay. So we see here, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And Babel turns into Babel. Okay. So Babel is Babel. So you, you see that when you hear somebody going, 
uh, he's, he's a babbler. This babbler. They'll talk about a guy who's babbling on about something or a babbling brook. That's the, that all comes from the Tower of Babel. But it, was, it, can, it comes on as Babel. And it, also Erech and Akkad and Kalnith and, and the land of Shinar. So he was a mighty guy, okay? And uh, if you'll notice that out of these things, verse 11, out of that land went forth Asher and builded what? Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Calah. And so Nineveh was probably the largest city in the ancient world. It had walls that were 100 feet plus high and 40 to 50 feet wide. Now that's the Sunshine Skyway from the water to the pavement okay on the bridge at the very top uh, where you're driving across it's about a hundred feet right there and then you have 40 feet wide which is about the width of this room right here or maybe this way 40 feet so you know it, those that's a big huge giant area that was so big they could farm in there and they had water and they had you know everything was internal they lived inside that now you see small versions of that in europe with castles Okay, but, but back then, they had great walled city. Why did they do that? Why were they so big? Why were the walls 100 feet? Why do you need a 100-foot wall to keep a 6-foot, 7-foot guy out? Because the guys weren't 6-foot or 7-foot. Some of them were 9 and 10-foot, okay? And uh, they could scale those walls, and they could get over. You see, they fought from the tops of the walls, and that's how they protected themselves. And in those days, that's all they could do. And so this begins to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, and then Nimrod gets to build him a tower. Look at verse 11, chapter 11, verse 1. He says, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So here's where it all ends up. Okay, so Shem, Ham, and Japheth have all these tribes now, and they're just growing and growing and growing. And, and this, this period now, since the flood, has gone on about 400, 500 years, and they're just populating the earth like crazy. Okay, but they're supposed to scatter and they're supposed to go and, and spread out. Okay, and notice verse 31 of chapter 10. He says, these are the sons of Shem, which is where the uh, sons of Abraham would come through. He says, after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So you, you get the idea how it, 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 it plays out for you. And it, it, it comes up to a peak. The flood kills them all. The judgment of God gets them all, except for Noah and his three sons, their three wives, and his wife. The, the eight souls come through, and now they start all over again. <clears throat> and this is what happens. Now look at 11.1. Uh, it says, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now this is very important. One language, one speech. Not multiple languages, one language, one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there and they said one to another, let us go, let us make brick and burn them truly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. So evidently, the plain of Shinar had plenty of slime, had plenty of pitch. We would probably call that tar, tar pitch. Like the, the, the La Brea tar pits out there where you live in California, they have those tar pits. Well, when you use tar and, and uh, fiber, like hay or straw or whatever, and you put bricks together with that, and you get all that built, and you smear that stuff all over the top, you know, all over the thing, and then you mortar that over, you know what's going to happen? It's going to be strong. And they're going to build, and they built themselves a tower, okay? And they said, go, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered. Now, God told them to scatter and replenish the earth. God told them to do that. And what's happened now is they don't want to scatter. They're doing the same thing they were in Genesis 4. Instead of going and being a vagabond and, 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 and you know, and moving around... What does he do? He goes and he formulates something that God told him not to do. The, in the Bible, the concept of a city is not something God designed to happen. Okay, Man started the idea of the city. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't use cities and so forth, because really, when you look at the battle between Satan and God, it's really the tale of two cities, isn't it? It's between Babel and Jerusalem. 
It's between Babylon and Jerusalem. So in the book of the Revelation over here, who, who's running the whole thing? The whore of Babylon is running it. And it's Babylonian, see? It is the distinction here, because this man is a hunter of men, the distinction and, and the fame of Babylon is not the hanging gardens, the seven wonders of the world, or the city itself that later became Babylon. It was the tower. The tower was the idolatry. The tower was the worshiping of the creature rather than God. They had left God, and four or five hundred years after Noah, you could see why they could easily do that. Okay, And so they've left Noah's God, they've left God, and they're now worshiping the creature rather than the creator. They are doing this through the power of the zodiac. The zodiac is a, 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 what we would call the witness of God in the stars of the plan and the story of redemption. And God has a big cyclical panorama. We would probably, you know, kind of look at it as a, a, a big map, really. But it is a, it's a star map in the sky. If you look up there at camp, we were looking at the stars a lot because you can see them better out in the woods. It's not as you know, bright from the city lights. And we're looking at the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and the Pleiades and Three Sisters and all these different things. And they're just, they're just so perfectly laid out. But you're only looking at one, one big little bit of it in the sky. When you really start studying the zodiac and you see the beginning of that starting with Virgo and the end of it uh, ending in Leo, you realize that from the Virgin Mary to the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, there is a story out there, and it involves an archer, and it involves all kinds of things. A, a guy gets wounded, and you can see all this stuff. Now, in order to understand what's going on, they would take the stars, and they would draw lines like connect the dots, and then they would get the figures. You ever, you ever done connect the dots when you play in a, in a book? Yeah, that's what they did. So they're looking up there at those things, and they're laying out there on the, on the hill with their sons and, and their families, and they're, as those stars during times of the year, they're, they're moving across the sky, and they're looking at them, and they're telling the story annually all year long. They've got no written Bible. They've got God's Word directly spoken to whoever he was speaking to, and then they've got the witness that's up there in the stars. Now, where did it all originally come from? Well, it started with him talking to Adam and Eve and passing this information on. Uh, this thing was passed on from generation to generation to generation, but when you get to the ark, what happens? It finds itself only passed on to these four men. And then these four men get off the ark, and it's pretty amazing what they must have learned and what they must have known because they produce an entire giant civilization from those four men. And look at all the things they began to do. Okay, So you have these people coming off the ark and they go to different areas of the world. Okay, They go to different areas. Turn over to Acts chapter... Hold your place there. We're going to come right back there. Turn to Acts chapter 17. And notice what Paul says, and just, just so you can tie Paul into this, because he is going to mention it. And uh, he's in Athens on Mars Hill, and he's preaching to those guys, and he's talking to them about their idolatry. And uh, look at verse uh, 23. He says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription. Now, I don't know why they did this, except they're just trying to cover their bases. They just put one up and said, to the unknown God. There might be one out there we missed. To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. The one I'm going to tell you about is the one that's unknown to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't have all these other ones. <laughs> he says, God that made the world and all things therein. Verse 24, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. That's really hard for an evolutionist to swallow. He won't, he, he'll choke on that verse, all of these verses. And hath made of one blood, notice, all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. One 
what? Blood of all nations of men to dwell on the face of all the earth. People are fighting over what color they are today. They're fighting over their social status. They're fighting over money. They're fighting over what they, you know, all these different things. And what they fail to realize is those three young men that came off of that ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, are really the beginning of the nations. What is, what is it that they have in common? Before we start talking about the differences, why don't we talk about what the commonalities are? Yeah, there were some, some of them that went down into Africa and they populated Africa. Some of them went over into the land of the year of the Chaldees, where Abraham was. Uh, and then others went to other places. So you have Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and all three of them basically make up three different groups of people. The Shemitic race is the group that comes from Shem. Then you have Ham, the Hamites, they come down into Africa. And then you have the sons of Japheth, which are basically the Europeans. They're the lighter skinned, you know, blonde, red headed, blonde headed, whatever, dark headed. But they're going to be more uh, blue eyed, green eyed, hazel eyed, whereas the other ones are going to be brown eyed. Okay? Uh, the Bible describes the Lord Jesus Christ in Solomon's uh, pictorial as having deep set dark eyes, like a dove, dove's eyes. They're black, okay? And when you see a dark-eyed person, you say, that's not, that's not an Irishman, okay? An Irishman does not have eyes like that. When you see these eyes that are large and brown or large and really dark, what are they, what are they a picture of? A particular group of people. So what they fail to realize is even though there are differences and they go to different parts of the world, aren't they all three brothers coming from the same father, coming off the same boat? Nobody wants to say that. Okay? They, they don't stop and think about these things. Paul is saying they're coming from one blood, all nations of men, for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, where they would go and where they would stay. Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets, the Greek poets have said, he says, for we also, for we are also his offspring. So Paul's re redirecting you. Now go back to chapter 11, he's reminding you. Now, here's the breakup of this group. Let's just read that quickly, and we've got to stop here. The, 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 the breakup of the group takes place in Genesis 11, and over there on the board, you'll see it's the fall of the nations. That's verses 1 through 9 of chapter 11. Okay, so we got down to verse 4. Now go to 11, 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. You see that? Just like verse 1. And this they begin to do. He's not happy with this. All right? He says, And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Let us uh, go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, what is implied in that verse? What's happening in that verse? What is he creating? He's creating all the languages. Now, I'm not saying that every language we have today was present at Babel. What I'm saying is the root languages were, and those root languages came out into their various forms. Do we have certain languages that are Latin-based? Yes. Okay, so English and Spanish are both Latin-based, right? If you go to Bulgaria and you see something that's Cyrillic over there, that's a different base. That's Russian. That's basically what the Soviets speak. Okay, so Bulgaria, all the Eastern Bloc companies, countries, they have this different kind of thinking about the words and the word structure. If you notice how complicated some of their words are, you go over to India and you look at that language and you say, I look at some of these Indian names, and they're, they're so long, and th they don't even make sense that, that it's even a, a, a word. I mean, you look at it just like, like a bunch of letters. But in their language, it's different. You look in their language, it's only that long. But in our language, it's like that long, you know? It's like, well, because they've got to write, write it out with Latin letters. So 
And it doesn't even make sense grammatically. I try to say words in Bulgarian. It took me 10 times to try to say the word. And Nick says, all you have to do to speak Bulgarian is put a handful of pebbles in your mouth and then just speak. And that's how you do it. <laughs> because when you try to say those words, you can't, your tongue won't do it. But yet we hear people speak Italian and Spanish and they speak it so fast, we can't understand it so quickly. How do they do that? And then we hear other languages. So I don't think all the languages are here at this time, but I do think all the root languages are here. Because the, the main thing is they began to talk to one another and they couldn't understand one another. And as they couldn't understand one another, they would seek out other people who were speaking the same language and that group of people would stay together and then they would go. And wouldn't you naturally gravitate to somebody who could speak your language? I mean, if you went to Italy and you couldn't speak Italian, wouldn't you seek out somebody who says, you know, that can speak English? Sure you would. You want to find somebody who could speak English and so you could communicate. In Bulgaria, there was nobody speaking English over there. We went over into, uh, uh, over into, uh, 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 I can't remember the name of the other little country we went into. But uh, they, they all spoke a form of kind of Bulgarian. It was very similar. But they all spoke English over there almost. But some of them couldn't, but they could understand it, which was confusing to me. How could you understand it and not speak it? Well, they recognized the words because their kids were saying these things to them. Okay, So they knew what certain words meant, but they, couldn't, they didn't actually learn those words. So the kids are speaking English and... and uh, the other language and then, then the, but the parents could understand what I was saying but they, they, they would really struggle to try to get it out in English because they don't speak English technically it's fascinating and so now what God does is he does this to to drive them away okay if you'll notice verse 8 he says so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city, they quit. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So you see it as Babel here in Hebrew, and then you'll see it, in, you'll see it called Babel back in, from the Greek over in the New Testament. Now, th this is the beginning of the fall of the nations. Uh, uh, they fell right there meaning that they were scattered. They, they were trying to be one big nation, and God breaks them up into uh, the whole thing. So they, they begin in Genesis 1, and the concept begins, but when he goes in there and he breaks them up, they fall from being one big giant nation to a bunch of smaller nations. And that's, that's why we have all these nations around the world is because of what happened at Babel. Okay? Now, that, that's fairly easy, right? Now, we don't have time to start into this today, but I want to tell you that God has a nation. If you'll notice under nations over there, that God's nation, it was from this blend and chaos of nations that took place after Babel that he calls Abraham out of Europe, Chaldees, and he's going to form a nation for himself, a holy nation, a separate nation, a private nation, so to speak. And they grew and grew and grew and grew until they reached the apex and their pinnacle was reached over here under King David and Solomon. And after that particular time, it got to the top and it fell apart. Because of what happened with Solomon's sons and following the, reign, the death of David and the reign of Solomon for 40 years, the thing fell apart and it deteriorated down into idolatry. Solomon brought the idolatry into Israel through the wives of the other nations. He married into those families. And as he did, he brought, they brought their idols with them and they brought their religions with them. And now, instead of having this wonderful, beautiful place that everybody kept coming to look at the wonders of God, it began to be infested with idolatry and then God took them and he, he judged them and took them down into Babylon and there they stayed for 70 years as a slave system just like they did in Egypt before. And so after that, they came out, and that's where we'll get into that later about in the book of Daniel, because that's where the political 
power of the nations was now officially taken away from the one nation who had it, and then it was given to the Persians. And that's where you see the beginning of all of that, where the Gentile world nations now begin with Persia. Persia gets conquered into two, and then it becomes Medes and Persians, the Media Persian Empire. And then that group is conquered by Alexander the Great, and then the Greek Empire comes along, and then finally Greece is conquered by Rome, and then so forth. You, you see how the whole thing begins to build, and that the political thing is so powerful. And that's what we have now, and that is described as the times. If you look under that fall of nations there, you see the times of the Gentiles. That's where we are right now. We are still in that part of God's program. We're in the times of the Gentiles right now. Look at Luke chapter 21, and we'll stop with this verse right here. Luke 21. This is really interesting. Luke chapter 21. We live in the times of the Gentiles. We do not live under a single solitary nation that God is controlling that we call the nation of Israel. That's not happening today. Uh, Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. Uh, this is the destruction is foretold of Jerusalem. In verse 20, uh, you, send, you begin to... Now, some people say this is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., this is not true. This is the destruction at the end. Uh, during the tribulation, this is not the sudden coming of Christ right here. Okay. This is not the destruction of what happened in 70 AD. Uh, <clears throat> look at verse uh, 22. He says, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. You see the time marker there tells you this is the end of prophecy. This is where the prophetic program starts to come to an end. And, of course, the millennial kingdom will continue a thousand years, and this whole earthly program is over with. Okay? So notice what he says. He says, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. That's the 1260 days of the second half of the Great Tribulation, or the, what we call the Great Tribulation. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now compare that with Romans chapter 11. Paul is now telling you in Romans chapter 11, and we're, we're, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but I want to kind of show you how this is going to pan out. You can see where we're going. Romans chapter 11, and Paul's asking a question. In chapter 9, he's going to teach you about Israel's unbelief and time past and how much of a failure they were. In chapter 10, he's going to be talking about the time that he lived in, which is really still the time we live in, okay? The but now period. This is what's happening now, and Israel doesn't believe it. They're enemies for, from us because of the gospel's sake, and for now, they're just doing what all everybody else is doing, the Gentiles are doing. There's no difference. He's declared all that in chapter 3. Then in chapter 11, you're going to see Israel's future, and Israel's future involves them getting saved and being restored back unto her former glory. Look at verse 25. He says, Romans 11, 25, he says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So what part of the nation is blind? The leadership. Can Jews get saved today? Yes. But they're not really, they can be Jews as, as to their religion, but they have no nation. See, today they want to say that, that what's going on over there in the Middle East with Israel forming as a nation in 1948 that that's the, the sanction of, of God. No, 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 no. That's not, that doesn't have anything to do with prophecy. That's not going to happen 
All these things that they're talking about ain't going to happen until we get rid of this dispensation grace on the chart. What's happening over there of those Zionists starting that country over there? That has nothing to do with God's program. God's not, he didn't have his hand in that. You're going to find out what happens to them. That group of people over there right now, they're apostates. They're completely apostate. Matter of fact, there are more Jews over here than there are over there. And the ones over there, three-quarters of them don't believe it. Okay, They have nothing to do with it. The people over there that are in power religiously, the ones that are walking around with the little curly hairs and the big mink hats, the ones you see, the Hasidic Jews, we would call them Orthodox Jews. They don't believe in Messiah. They don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ was God. They don't believe in, in, in any of that. They're just walking around trying to stay with their religious system because they believe eventually Messiah will come. So they say. He's come and gone. They're living in the dispensation of grace. And if they want to get saved, they're going to have to believe the gospel of the grace of God to get saved. And they're not going to believe that because in the tribulation period, they're going to be the ones that sign the contract with the Antichrist, and he's going to say, ha ha, I got you, and he catches them in the net, man, and they're all gone. The people that God finds after this tribulation is over and he comes back, the ones that he finds hiding, those are going to be the ones that trusted what he said. How do you endure to the end with that program? You do what God said and you go hide. Okay, because you're of a mindset that Jesus is coming back. These people over here are of a mindset that no, 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 he's not coming back. He's on the throne now. They believe it. Oh, they're going to buy it hook, line, and sinker. Second Thessalonians 2 says so. So this whole thing is all about the restoration of Israel. We live in the times of the Gentiles. Politically. See? And God, who has formed his own personal, private nation, has yet to see them believe. They will not believe. Now, today, some of them do believe. Individuals believe. But as a national entity, they do not. Now, one more part of this verse I want you to see. And look at verse 25. He doesn't use the term times of the Gentiles here. Notice the term that he uses in verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant. I'm in verse 25 of chapter 11. That ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. So now Paul's going to talk to you about mystery truth, and he is going to, to bring it up, and he's going to talk to you about it because in this mystery program, he says, I want you to understand something, and there's something about your identity here that he wants you to learn. He says, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. He says, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, meaning that you're, you're thinking you're Israel when you're not Israel. This is a big problem for Christendom today. This is why they're hanging out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John preaching the wrong gospel, is they think they're spiritual Israel. There is no such thing as spiritual Israel today. It does not exist. And it will never exist until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And then the whole nation's going to get saved. They're going to believe on him. Finally, he says that blindness in part, part of them, the bulk of them, I would say, are blind. But some can get saved. We just said it in Romans chapter 1, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Can the Jew get saved today? Yes. He made a difference back here between Jew and Gentile to prove there's no difference. And now he's concluded all in unbelief, and that's what chapter 3 is going to tell us when we get to it. But notice what he says. He says, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So what's the difference between the times of the Gentiles, where just the Gentile nations are running the world, and the fullness of the Gentiles? The fullness of the Gentiles is the dispensation of the grace of God right here, where God is primarily saving Gentiles today, some small part Jews, but mainly the Gentiles today of the world are being put, that are being saved are being put into the church, the body of Christ, so they can go out to the heavenly places. That's the fullness. And that's one of the reasons right there in that passage, I believe that until that fullness occurs, we're not going to leave, rapture-wise. And at the end of this, when that is filled up, and it's completely done and ready to go, and there's nothing else left for it to sit on the launch pad, how long do you think it's going to sit here? 
hopefully not any longer than, than it has to be because when you get everybody in that church, the body of Christ, to fill it up to the very, very, very top and it's all filled up, what are you going to do? You're going to take it out. And then you're going to start that other program up again and it'll start right here, right when this happens, it will start right where it left off over here at the Stone of Stephen, or pretty close thereabouts. There's going to be a, some setup time there, but I don't know how long it is, but I think it's going to be pretty fast. I don't think it's going to be rambling on for thousands of more years, that's for sure. You get an idea now more about how the nations came into play and, and what's going on with the nations today. This message that we preach is to be believed among all nations today. The gospel, the grace of God, is the gospel that saves. It's the gospel that Paul has. And until God's done with it, this prophetic program right here is never going to be finished. Let me share some with you. If you're looking at eternity, if you draw a timeline, okay, uh, this won't take long. I'll just get rid of some of this here. We've been talking about parentheses here for 30 years almost, okay? I was explaining how a parenthesis works back there to Naomi. I asked her, do you know what a parenthesis is? She says, yeah, pay attention to it. <laughs> I said, okay, good. So if you have a timeline, right, and we have a timeline there, right, and we come and we have a gap called the dispensation of grace, right? What happens if you take the entire chart the prophetic program and the dispensation of grace, the whole chart. What if you took that entire chart and you slipped it right into eternity? Right here. Here's the chart. We call the information on that chart. Here's, here's eternity past. Right? And here's eternity future out here. Do you get the idea that in the program of God and the Godhead, billions and billions and billions of eons together, comes to Calvary, things change, and then it's going to go on out into the future and we're going to be with him for billions and billions of years. Do you get the idea that, that this whole thing is kind of like just a big parenthesis in his life? You see how it's just inserted in there? This is the whole show right here. The kingdom program, the body of Christ, all of it together. But, but in the course of all of this, that's just, it's a crucial point in history for the Godhead because everything is looking up to the Godhead before it, and then everything with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is looking backwards to the cross. So the Godhead is looking backwards to the cross from eternity like we are. We all look back at it, but over here they were looking forward to it. This thing was planned out, and they lived together in the Godhead for each other, looking to that event. And what you have there, right, where you see that little blip, this took place. And we identify this as from the foundation of the world to the end of it. But when we talk about our program, we go back from, to before the foundation of the world. So where are we? In this program, we're here. We're back here. He had us in mind for a purpose before this whole thing ever came about. As a matter of fact, this whole thing works itself out so beautifully that without this right here, and the explanation of it all, this could never come to pass. You cannot have a program for heaven and earth where you just tell the story of the earthly kingdom. You can't do it. If you're not going to fulfill the program in the heavenlies, then the heavenly government has nobody to run it. You see how we're such an important link in this whole thing? Because we go out there and we take that place of those principalities, powers, and dominions and it allows us to participate in a way that nobody ever thought we were going to be there. Satan was never worried about you and I going out there until it was shown that we're going to get new bodies and we'll be able to be out there. That scared him because he thought we were earthbound. 
And I, I believe that it's really interesting when you look at it all like this, you see this, it, it starts making it simpler and simpler to see that there is a major distinction between prophecy and mystery in your Bible. And that, that distinction must be maintained. If you don't maintain it, then what's going to happen is you're going to be conceited and wise in your own conceits, thinking you're somebody you're not, which is what a conceited person is, right? They're not necessarily always arrogant, but they, they are, they're misinformed. So, you know, it's just that way. And, and it, it, to me, it makes more sense. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll stop. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. And we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the plan that you have for us. And we thank you for it all today. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay.